The Discourses of Epictetus Translated by George Long Book 3 Chapter 24 Part 2 That we ought not to be moved by a desire of those things which are not in our power. Well then, do you wish me to pay court to a certain person? To go to his doors? If reason requires this to be done for the sake of country, for the sake of kinsmen, for the sake of mankind, why should you not go? You are not ashamed to go to the doors of a shoemaker, when you are in want of shoes, nor to the door of a gardener, when you want lettuces, and are you ashamed to go to the doors of the rich, when you want anything? Dash yes, for I have no awe of a shoemaker. Don't feel any awe of the rich, dash, nor will I flatter the gardener. And do not flatter the rich, dash, how then shall I get what I want? Do I say to you, go as if you were certain to get what you want? And do not I only tell you, that you may do what is becoming to yourself? Why then should I still go? That you may have gone, that you may have discharged the duty of a citizen, of a brother, of a friend. And further remember that you have gone to the shoemaker, to the seller of vegetables, who have no power in anything great or noble, though he may sell dear. You go to buy lettuces, they cost an obelisk, penny, but not a talent. So it is here also. The matter is worth going for to the rich man's door, well, I will go. It is worth talking about, let it be so, I will talk with him, but you must also kiss his hand and flatter him with praise, away with that. It is a talent's worth, it is not profitable to me, nor to the state, nor to my friends, to have done that which spoils a good citizen and a friend a dash, but you will seem not to have been eager about the matter, if you do not succeed. Have you again forgotten why you went? Know ye not that a good man does nothing for the sake of appearance, but for the sake of doing right? Dash, what advantage is it then to him to have done right? And what advantage is it to a man who writes the name of Dion to write it as he ought? The advantage is to have written it, Dash, is there no reward then? Do you seek a reward for a good man greater than doing what is good and just? At Olympia, you wish for nothing more, but it seems to you enough to be crowned at the games. Does it seem to you so small and worthless a thing to be good and happy? For these purposes being introduced by the gods into this city, the world, and it being now your duty to undertake the work of a man, do you still want nurses also and a mama, and do foolish women by their weeping move you and make you effeminate? Will you thus never cease to be a foolish child? Know you not that he who does the acts of a child, the older he is, the more ridiculous he is? In Athens, did you see no one by going to his house? Dash I visited any man that I pleased. Here also be ready to see, and you will see whom you please, only let it be without meanness, neither with desire nor with aversion and your affairs will be well managed. But this result does not depend on going nor on standing at the doors, but it depends on what is within, on your opinions. When you have learned not to value things which are external and not dependent on the will, and to consider that not one of them is your own, but that these things only are your own, to exercise the judgment well, to form opinions, to move towards an object, to desire, to turn from a thing, where is there any longer room for flattery, where for meanness? Why do you still long for the quiet there, at Athens, and for the places to which you are accustomed? Wait a little and you will again find these places familiar, then, if you are of so ignoble a nature, again if you leave these also, weep and lament. How then shall I become of an affectionate temper? By being of a noble disposition, and happy. 
For it is not reasonable to be mean-spirited, nor to lament yourself, nor to depend on another, nor ever to blame God or man. I entreat you, become an affectionate person in this way, by observing these rules. But if through this affection, as you name it, you are going to be a slave and wretched, there is no profit in being affectionate. And what prevents you from loving another as a person subject to mortality, as one who may go away from you? Did not Socrates love his own children? He did, but it was as a free man, as one who remembered that he must first be a friend to the gods. For this reason he violated nothing which was becoming to a good man, neither in making his defense nor by fixing a penalty on himself, nor even in the former part of his life when he was a senator or when he was a soldier. But we are fully supplied with every pretext for being of ignoble temper, some for the sake of a child, some for a mother, and others for brethren's sake. But it is not fit for us to be unhappy on account of any person but to be happy on account of all, but chiefly on account of God who has made us for this end. Well, did Diogenes love nobody who was so kind and so much a lover of all that for mankind in general he willingly undertook so much labor and bodily sufferings? He did love mankind, but how? As became a minister of God, at the same time caring for men and being also subject to God. For this reason all the earth was his country, and no particular place, and when he was taken prisoner he did not regret Athens nor his associates and friends there, but even he became familiar with the pirates and tried to improve them, and being sold afterwards he lived in Corinth as before at Athens. And he would have behaved the same, if he had gone to the country of the Peribi. Thus is freedom acquired. For this reason he used to say, ever since Antisthenes made me free, I have not been a slave. How did Antisthenes make him free? Hear what he says, Antisthenes taught me what is my own, and what is not my own, possessions are not my own, nor kinsmen, domestics, friends, nor reputation, nor places familiar, nor mode of life, all these belong to others. What then is your own? the use of appearances. This he showed to me, that I possess it free from hindrance, and from compulsion, no person can put an obstacle in my way, no person can force me to use appearances otherwise than I wish. Who then has any power over me? Philip or Alexander, or Perdiccas, or the great king. How have they this power? For if a man is going to be overpowered by a man, he must long before be overpowered by things. If then pleasure is not able to subdue a man, nor pain, nor fame, nor wealth, but he is able, when he chooses, to spit out all his poor body in a man's face and depart from life, whose slave can he still be? But if he dwelt with pleasure in Athens, and was overpowered by this manner of life, his affairs would have been at every man's command, the stronger would have had the power of grieving him. How do you think that Diogenes would have flattered the pirates that they might sell him to some Athenian, that sometime he might see that beautiful Piraeus, and the long walls and the Acropolis? In what condition would you see them? As a captive, a slave and mean, and what would be the use of it for you? Dash, not so, but I should see them as a free man. Show me how you would be free. Observe, some person has caught you, who leads you away from your accustomed place of abode and says, You are my slave, for it is in my power to hinder you from living as you please, it is in my power to treat you gently, and to humble you, when I choose, on the contrary, you are cheerful and go elated to Athens. What do you say to him who treats you as a slave? What means have you of finding one who will rescue you from slavery? Or cannot you even look him in the face, but without saying more, do you entreat to be set free? Man, you ought to go gladly to prison, hastening, going before those who lead you there. Then, I ask you, are you unwilling to live in Rome and desire to live in Hellas, Greece? 
And when you must die, will you then also fill us with your lamentations, because you will not see Athens nor walk about in the Lycian? Have you gone abroad for this? Was it for this reason you have sought to find some person from whom you might receive benefit? What benefit? That you may solve syllogisms more readily, or handle hypothetical arguments? And for this reason did you leave brother, country, friends, your family, that you might return when you had learned these things? So you did not go abroad to obtain constancy of mind, nor freedom from perturbation, nor in order that being secure from harm you may never complain of any person, accuse no person, and no man may wrong you, and thus you may maintain your relative position without impediment? This is a fine traffic that you have gone abroad for in syllogisms and sophistical arguments and hypothetical, if you like, take your place in the agora, market or public place, and proclaim them for sale like dealers in physic. Will you not deny even all that you have learned that you may not bring a bad name on your theorems as useless? What harm has philosophy done you? Wherein has Chrysippus injured you that you should prove by your acts that his labors are useless? Were the evils that you had there, at home, not enough, those which were the cause of your pain and lamentation, even if you had not gone abroad? Have you added more to the list? And if you again have other acquaintances and friends, you will have more causes for lamentation, and the same also if you take an affection for another country. Why then do you live to surround yourself with other sorrows upon sorrows through which you are unhappy? Then, I ask you, do you call this affection? What affection, man? If it is a good thing, it is the cause of no evil, if it is bad, I have nothing to do with it. I am formed by nature for my own good, I am not formed for my own evil. What then is the discipline for this purpose? First of all the highest and the principal, and that which stands as it were at the entrance, is this, when you are delighted with anything, be delighted as with a thing which is not one of those which cannot be taken away. But as with something of such a kind, as an earthen pot is, or a glass cup, that when it has been broken, you may remember what it was, and may not be troubled. So in this matter also, if you kiss your own child, or your brother or friend, never give full license to the appearance. Fantasian, and allow not your pleasure to go as far as it chooses, but check it, and curb it as those who stand behind men in their triumphs, and remind them that they are mortal. Do you also remind yourself in like manner, that he whom you love is mortal? And that what you love is nothing of your own, it has been given to you for the present, not that it should not be taken from you, nor has it been given to you for all time, but as a fig is given to you or a bunch of grapes at the appointed season of the year. But if you wish for these things in winter, you are a fool. So if you wish for your son or friend when it is not allowed to you, you must know that you are wishing for a fig in winter. For such as winter is to a fig, such is every event which happens from the universe to the things which are taken away according to its nature. And further, at the times when you are delighted with a thing, place before yourself the contrary appearances. What harm is it while you are kissing your child to say with a lisping voice, Tomorrow you will die, and to a friend also, tomorrow you will go away or I shall, and never shall we see one another again. Dash, but these are words of bad omen. And some incantations also are of bad omen, but because they are useful, I don't care for this, only let them be useful. But do you call things to be of bad omen except those which are significant of some evil? Cowardice is a word of bad omen, and meanness of spirit, and sorrow, and grief and shamelessness. These words are a bad omen, and yet we ought not to hesitate to utter them in order to protect ourselves against the things. Do you tell me that a name which is significant of any natural thing is of evil omen? Say that even for the ears of corn to be reaped is of bad omen, 
for it signifies the destruction of the heirs, but not of the world. Say that the falling of the leaves also is a bad omen, and for the dried fig to take the place of the green fig, and for raisins to be made from the grapes. For all these things are changes from a former state into other states, not a destruction, but a certain fixed economy and administration. Such as going away from home and a small change, such as death, a greater change, not from the state which now is to that which is not, but to that which is not now, dash shall I then no longer exist. You will not exist, but you will be something else of which the world now has need. For you also came into existence not when you chose, but when the world had need of you. Wherefore the wise and good man, remembering who he is and whence he came, and by whom he was produced, is attentive only to this, how he may fill his place with due regularity, and obediently to God. Dost thou still wish me to exist, life? I will continue to exist as free, as noble in nature, as thou hast wished me to exist, for thou hast made me free from hindrance in that which is my own. But hast thou no further need of me? I thank thee, and so far I have remained for thy sake, and for the sake of no other person, and now in obedience to thee I depart. How dost thou depart? Again, I say, as thou hast pleased, as free, as thy servant, as one who has known thy commands and thy prohibitions. And so long as I shall stay in thy service, whom dost thou me to be? A prince or a private man, a senator or a common person, a soldier or a general, a teacher or a master of a family. Whatever place and position thou mayest assign to me, as Socrates says, I will die ten thousand times rather than desert them. And where dost thou will me to be? In Rome or Athens, or Thebes or Gyra. Only remember me there where I am. If thou sendest me to a place where there are no means for men living according to nature, I shall not depart from life in disobedience to thee. But as if thou wast giving me the signal to retreat, I do not leave thee, let this be far from my intention, but I perceive that thou hast no need of me. If means of living according to nature be allowed to me, I will seek no other place than that in which I am, or other men than those among whom I am. Let these thoughts be ready to hand by night and by day, these you should write, these you should read, about these you should talk to yourself and to others. Ask a man, can you help me at all for this purpose, and further? go to another and to another. Then if anything that is said be contrary to your wish, this reflection first will immediately relieve you that it is not unexpected. For it is a great thing in all cases to say, I knew that I begot a son who is mortal. For so you also will say, I knew that I am mortal, I knew that I may leave my home, I knew that I may be ejected from it, I knew that I may be led to prison. Then if you turn round and look to yourself, and seek the place from which comes that which has happened, you will forthwith recollect that it comes from the place of things which are out of the power of the will, and of things which are not my own. What then is it to me? Then, you will ask, and this is the chief thing, and who is it that send it? The leader, or the general, the state, the law of the state. Give it me then for I must always obey the law in everything. Then, when the appearance of things pains you, for it is not in your power to prevent this, contend against it by the aid of reason, conquer it, do not allow it to gain strength, nor to lead you to the consequences by raising images such as it pleases and as it pleases. If you be in Gyra, do not imagine the mode of living at Rome. And how many pleasures there were for him who lived there, and how many there would be for him who returned to Rome, but fix your mind on this matter, how a man who lives in Gyra ought to live in Gyra like a man of courage. And if you be in Rome, do not imagine what the life in Athens is, but think only of the life in Rome. Then 
in the place of all other delights substitute this, that of being conscious that you are obeying God, that not in word, but indeed you are performing the acts of a wise and good man. For what a thing it is for a man to be able to say to himself, now whatever the rest may say in solemn manner in the schools and may be judged to be saying in a way contrary to common opinion. Or, or in a strange way, this I am doing, and they are sitting and are discoursing of my virtues and inquiring about me and praising me, and of this Zeus has willed that I shall receive from myself a demonstration, and shall myself know if he has a soldier. Such as he ought to have, a citizen such as he ought to have, and if he has chosen to produce me to the rest of mankind as a witness of the things which are independent of the will, see that you fear without reason, that you foolishly desire what you do desire, seek not the good in things external. Seek it in yourselves, if you do not, you will not find it. For this purpose he leads me at one time hither, at another time sends me thither, shows me to men as poor, without authority, and sick, sends me to Jaira, leads me into prison, not because he hates me, far from him, be such a meaning, for who hates the best of his servants? Nor yet because he cares not for me, for he does not neglect any even of the smallest things, but he does this for the purpose of exercising me and making use of me as a witness to others. Being appointed to such a service, do I still care about the place in which I am, or with whom I am, or what men say about me? And do I not entirely direct my thoughts to God and to his instructions and commands? Having these things, or thoughts, always in hand, and exercising them by yourself, and keeping them in readiness, you will never be in want of one to comfort you and strengthen you. For it is not shameful to be without something to eat, but not to have reason sufficient for keeping away fear and sorrow. But if once you have gained exemption from sorrow and fear, will there any longer be a tyrant for you, or a tyrant's guard, or attendance on Caesar? Or shall any appointment to offices at court cause you pain, or shall those who sacrifice in the capital on the occasion of being named to certain functions, cause pain to you who have received so great authority from Zeus? Only do not make a proud display of it, nor boast of it, but show it by your acts, and if no man perceives it, be satisfied that you are yourself in a healthy state and happy. Book 3 Chapter 25 to those who fall off, desist, from their purpose. Consider as to the things which you propose to yourself at first, which you have secured, and which you have not, and how you are pleased when you recall to memory the one, and are pained about the other, and if it is possible, recover the things wherein you failed. For we must not shrink when we are engaged in the greatest combat but we must even take blows. For the combat before us is not in wrestling and the pancration, in which both the successful and the unsuccessful may have the greatest merit, or may have little. And in truth may be very fortunate or very unfortunate, but the combat is for good fortune and happiness themselves. Well then, even if we have renounced the contest in this matter, for good fortune and happiness, no man hinders us from renewing the combat again. And we are not compelled to wait for another four years that the games at Olympia may come again, but as soon as you have recovered and restored yourself, and employ the same zeal, you may renew the combat again, and if again you renounce it, you may again renew it. And if you once gain the victory, you are like him who has never renounced the combat. Only do not through a habit of doing the same thing, renouncing the combat, begin to do it with pleasure, and then like a bad athlete, go about after being conquered in all the circuit of the games like quails who have run away. The sight of a beautiful young girl overpowers me. Well, have I not been overpowered before? 
An inclination arises in me to find fault with a person, for have I not found fault with him before? You speak to us as if you had come off, from these things, free from harm, just as if a man should say to his physician who forbids him to bathe, Have I not bathed before? If then the physician can say to him, Well, and what then happened to you after the bath? Had you not a fever, had you not a headache? And when you found fault with a person lately, did you not do the act of a malignant person, of a trifling babbler, did you not cherish this habit in you by adding to it the corresponding acts? And when you were overpowered by the young girl, did you come off unharmed? Why then do you talk of what you did before? You ought, I think, remembering what you did, as slaves remember the blows which they have received, to abstain from the same faults. But the one case is not like the other, for in the case of slaves the pain causes the remembrance, but in the case of your faults, what is the pain, what is the punishment, for when have you been accustomed to fly from evil acts? Sufferings then of the trying character are useful to us, whether we choose or not.